Hello and welcome to the second podcast, Infection Control Experts in Conversation, hosted by Inivos. The podcasts, with the help of national experts, aim to support IP and C teams in the real NHS world by offering advice and suggesting pragmatic solutions to drive down healthcare associated infection. All evidence based, of course. My name is Liz Waters, a recently retired consultant nurse with 22 years experience in the IP and C world, so I know how tough it is out there. And so to our second podcast. You may recall the first podcast explored ward decontamination, including the evidence underpinning the solutions such as hydrogen peroxide vapour and UV light to drive down rates of C. difficile. Implementation, like all IP and C interventions, is challenging, and there is no doubt that ownership from divisions, directorates, clinical boards, or whatever they are called, alongside support from executive teams, is a hugely important factor. So this episode will pay particular attention to ownership, influence, and organisational responsibility. I'm delighted that Tracy Cooper has joined the podcast today. Tracy, a previous IPS president, has huge IP and C experience and is highly skilled at influencing from board to ward and beyond. Tracy will talk us through her experience of influencing executive teams, and I will describe my light bulb moment when I realised that ownership was an issue. But first to Tracy. Thank you, Liz. And thank you to Inivos for inviting me to participate in this podcast. Um, I suppose just to start, I think influencing executive teams is an art in which we also use the science. And I'm going to share with you some thoughts and reflections on what I think has worked for me. So I've learned, first of all, that it's really important to put yourself in the position of the person or the people you're trying to influence. So to really understand their drivers, their concerns and their challenges. And that's especially true when we think about influencing and engaging with executive teams. It's vital that we understand their very diverse pressures across the entire organisation, including the external pressures um, what are our external um, stakeholders and um, our, our wider national expectations and pressures, because that's a big factor when we're, we're coming to engage with our executives. Uh, and I think by doing that, it can really help you to sort of locate your narrative, for want of a better description, to frame your arguments in a context where executives are much more likely to listen and to really hear what you're trying to say. So in terms of building relationships, the relationship is critical. And I would say it's no good trying to build your relationship at the point you've got a big problem. You really need to start building your relationships and engaging with your execs from the beginning. So if you're in a role now, particularly a senior role, and you're not actively working to engage your exec team, I would say that's priority number one for you um, on the next day you go into work. Now, I would say it's primarily the role of the senior IP team members, especially your medical and nursing leads, but it isn't just those most senior team members, because actually, all team members potentially have an opportunity to engage with execs when they come across them. So how do we go about doing that? Well, I think my experience is that we need to engage with them on multiple fronts, and that's certainly my recommendation. So I'll, I'll talk now through a few ways that I've done that um, and use some examples as I talk about things that have worked for me. The first one I would say is get into meetings where the executives are present, as well as other senior managers, divisional or directorate managers, or whatever you have in your organisation, but get into those spaces where those people are present and then be an active participant in the meeting. Um, be positive and try and be creative. 
And I know from experience that can be very hard when you're feeling fairly overwhelmed and drained and exhausted. But my advice is definitely to try and do that because people will start to see you across a range of environments in your organisation. Um, the other thing is where you can plan your input to key items in those meetings. So have a look at the papers in advance. Think about what are the battles that you really need to bring to the table. Uh, and I think as senior IP members, we, we do need to, if you like, pick our battles and pick the things that are most important for us to um, be picking up and pushing forward. So think about what you can bring to the table that's helpful or positive and how you can frame your issues and challenges in the meeting. Um, because how you frame what you present or the challenges you pose to those members, including exec members, can really make a difference to how people receive that challenge and how engaged they then feel about dealing with the issue. So um, a good example, uh, and I'm sure people listening to this podcast will have had this experience many times as I have. Um, you're, you're sat looking at some papers and there's some audit data about an infection prevention element that's really poor with poor patient outcomes or worse, there's poor patient outcomes and a real lack of any data that tells you what's going on organisationally. Uh, and I would say things like uh, bacteremias and peripheral cannula care is a good example of this. Um, and, and I've often found that using phrases such as, I'm sure we're all really concerned about X, or I know you're, that we'll all agree this isn't an acceptable standard, but can I ask, what's being done to address this please and is there any support you need as a division from me to, to move that forward that can move that challenge um, from being a direct you know that isn't good enough that isn't acceptable to wrapping it into i'm sure we'll all agree because it goes without saying many times that everybody should agree but if somebody has got a, a paper that they brought to the table or an issue where they don't have the information or they have evidence that care is poor. I, I think making it more of a generic, we are all in this together and we I'm sure we'll all agree um, when you're then asking, so what's been done to address this, which is really the hard question that you want to ask, you know, this isn't good enough, what you're doing about this. And um, following it up with the what support do you need from me makes it very clear that you're expecting their leadership, but it's also being positive and supportive. And if your execs are in the room, your execs will see that. They'll see that positivity. They'll recognise that challenge and that will help to engage them. Um, and I found that a really useful process and way of framing questions over the years. I think the second thing then that I would frame in terms of actively engaging is the use of leadership walkabouts or whatever you call them. I've always called them leadership walkabouts. Um, invite your exec leads. Make sure you do ex uh, leadership walkabouts. Invite your exec leads along to join you or ask if you can join them on one of their executive walkabouts um, and frame it as a learning opportunity for you. Because what that does, even if it's only half an hour, it gives you some one to one time where you're walking about together, you're discussing issues and you're building that personal relationship. You're building your credibility. It gives you an opportunity to understand what the exact pressures are, but it also gives you an opportunity to point out those key issues of concern. And what I would say is don't use that to point out 26 different issues, because actually the thing that you're really worried about will get lost in the other 25, focus them on the key things that you want to flag up. So in my um, last few roles, I've used very focused walkabouts. I've done things like C. diff walkabouts, where I've, I've literally um, done my leadership walkabouts and I've taken an exec with me when they've been available, um, or I've taken the senior managers in the division and we've gone and we've actually looked at patients with C. diff, we've looked at their care, We've visited wards that have had patients with C. diff on and we've looked at those basic standards 
around cleanliness, hand hygiene, prescribing. Co colleagues listening to this will know what those factors are. I've also done them specifically around cleanliness. And when I've done that, I've not just taken the exec lead, I've taken the cleaning manager with me as well. And you don't often have your cleaning manager and your exec lead in the same forum other than the very formal meeting. And again, it's a great way to engage and develop those relationships. So I'd also strongly advise you to, if you haven't got one already, to request a board level infection prevention champion, somebody that's not an exec. So a non-exec or an independent member, depending on what your organisation is. Um, again, that gives you an opportunity to invite them directly to come on one of your leadership walkabouts. Uh, and I've used these in a number of ways in the past. I've used them to show the non-execs good practice when they've got a real concern about something. And we've been trying to explain through meeting papers and discussion in meetings what we're doing. Actually, a picture paints a thousand, if not a million words. So by taking them along, I've used it to give them assurance to talk to the staff on the wards and to really get a feel for what's going on. But I've also used them to frame those continuing issues and problems so that they have a better understanding. Uh, and that can be helpful because it means that they can then ask better framed questions of the execs, but also as of me as the lead in terms of accountability. Um, and an example of that is, for example, um, organisations where I've had a real lack of single rooms for isolation for a variety of things. And then we've looked at what we're doing to overcome that. So definitely get your leadership walkabouts. It's always tempting to bin leadership walkabouts when your diary's under pressure. I have to say they're some of the most valuable things you can do. And even if you only spend half an hour, it gets you out there and visible as well as visible with your exec team. So that would be my second tip. And then building on from that, I think my third tip is use the organisational governance structure. Now, by that, I mean the formal governance meeting structure. Uh, you will find, I'm sure, that your infection prevention and control committee or your DIPSI report regularly through those committees. Utilise that structure. And if there aren't regular papers going through, which give you the opportunity to highlight key issues, you can always ask for a paper to go by exception about a particular issue. And I've certainly done that when I've had a real concern. Now, it's important when you do that to just be very aware of the experience of executives in those meetings. So most trust level or health board level um, governance meetings will have papers in the order of 250 to 350 pages. The paper set, the document set is enormous. And somehow in amongst that, you have got to get your points across. So it's definitely not worth writing War and Peace. I, I know from my own experience going through papers uh, and reports for meetings, if I open a paper and it's six, seven, eight pages long, I'll skim the executive summary and I'll probably move on because I just haven't got time to read the depth and you don't want them to do that. So my advice and my experience is we need to make the papers clear, concise, and we need to use the correct template. So that correct template's really, really important because again, I've had papers that I've written, they've not been in the correct template, and they've just been binned out of the meeting because they're not in the correct template. So do use that. Um, don't shroud wave. So don't over egg the pudding or whatever other um, example you want to give. So be factual, back up what you're saying with data if you've got data. If you haven't got local data, use some national data, but frame your messages really carefully taking account of what those challenges are for the execs and that way you'll be able to use those sort of levers to really engage them. Now something I've learned in recent years uh, and really emphasised for me um, whilst working as a DIPSI during the pandemic is to include a written risk assessment in all of those papers, especially if you're having difficulty getting something progressed. 
And I found it useful to really risk score several options. So the option of taking the action that I'm recommending and the risk scoring the option of not taking the action I'm recommending. Um, to do that, you do need to think through and understand the range of potential risks and pressures. But probably the best example of, of that and something that is still very relevant at the moment is when you need to close some beds to allow deep cleaning after, for example, a patient with C. diff or a patient with a CPE. And at times in my career, I've experienced great difficulty in getting this to happen. Um, usually due to operational pressures and particularly uh, the operational pressures at the front door and the inability to offload ambulances. But what I've discovered is by producing these written risk scored risk assessments, and I use the standard NHS five by five risk matrix for that. So nothing um, particularly fancy or um, difficult to do. And what I've discovered is if you set that out along with national guidance on what you should be doing and your reference, the risk to other patients of not following the recommendation and don't just pick the obvious risk that other patients will get infected, but include the reputational risks, the risks of um, additional patients or additional outbreaks with um, some of our uh, commissioning organisations, uh, bed closures further down the line, length of stay, and that's a big one because every day a patient stays in a bed they don't need to, is a day longer we can't get a patient out of an ambulance, uh, as well as the money and the patient experience. So include all of those issues in your brief narrative about the risks. And then also risk score, what the risks are if you don't do what I want, if you don't close those beds. And you can nuance that. So, you know, what is the risk score if my emergency department cannot release an ambulance from outside the ED when they've got multiple triple nine calls and patients being resuscitated on the pavement, then actually I would score that as a higher risk than the risk of C. diff to patients um, developing elsewhere. However, when those ED pressures ease, then the C. diff risk becomes higher. So you can actually include that and you can make your recommendation around as soon as the escalation level falls to X, whatever X is in your, your organisation, then you can close those two beds, those four beds to deep clean. Quite useful as well to indicate the approximate length of closure, because when you say close beds, when people are up against it with admissions, that's quite a hard one. Whereas when you're saying, actually, we want to close four beds for four to five hours, that's probably much more palatable and understandable. So I found by doing that, that the execs are much more likely to support and engage with it because they can see you're actively trying to work with them and you understand the wider organisational context. They also very clearly then understand the infection risk in context um, and they can su actively support that recommendation to do it as soon as it becomes safe in the broadest context to do so that you're dealing with all of the risks relevant to their risk score. I think the other thing I would say with that approach is should you have execs that, that refuse to support you, and sometimes they do, then because it's written down and it's risk scored, they are very clearly accepting that level of risk. Um, and in terms of your professional accountability, you've got a very clear audit trail on that. And obviously, if you're including that as an issue as part of a governance paper and a meeting, then there'll be written meeting notes as well to support you. So hopefully you won't be in that position. But in the event you are, you've got a very clear audit trail and you can demonstrate your due diligence in terms of the Health and Safety at Work Act um, and health and safety for patients, but also your due diligence in terms of your own professional code of conduct. Um, so then moving on, I think the most important thing you can do to engage your exec team is keep an open dialogue. I think that alongside the walkabouts are the two key things. So usually that would be with your lead exec. Most often that's your medical or nursing director, but it might be someone else. I would say if it is someone else, keep your nursing director in the loop 
um, or your medical director or both. Um, keep them briefed on key issues and, and do that via email or via phone calls. Again, keep the email short. They get over 100 plus emails a day, some days, maybe 200. Keep it short. And over the years, I found that a modified SBAR approach has been really helpful. And it's been something I've used with my teams when I've been saying to them, this is the structure that I need you to brief me in so that I can extrapolate and brief on upwards. Um, there's always a temptation to go into detail. Don't go into too much detail. Your execs don't need to know that it's Mrs. Smith in bed three. Um, so my modified SBAR, I go with background first. So for example, C diff numbers on award over the past three months have been X, and currently our position against our target is Y. Then our situation might be we've had two new positive C diffs from the same bay on ward Y over the past three days. I then summarize the actions that we've already taken, and I would use bullet points. Don't go into long paragraphs. Bullet points are great and it just include the relevant info, including, for example, we've changed the curtains and we've cleaned the equipment, but we've been unable to close for a deep clean due to operational pressures. Very simple, very succinct, uh, and you know, maybe eight, 10 bullet points, whatever you need around the key actions. That tells them where the issues are, it tells them what you've done, and that gives them assurance and confidence that you're on it and then make the recommendation for further action, which in this scenario would be to close that bay for deep cleaning. Include there any support you need from them and be specific because they're not mind readers. So say, appreciate the operational pressures are extreme. Bed management um, won't entertain discussion on when we might close the bay at the moment. Can, can I have some support around doing this when the risk score gets to X or Y? So really frame that very clear as an ask. If it's something unusual or significant or reputationally a potential problem, I would always say ring them or text them if you've got their number. If you don't, get hold of them via their PA and just say there's something that's quite significant. They just need a very quick briefing. When have they got two minutes that I can quickly brief them? And again, they will then develop that confidence and trust in you because they know you will brief them, you will support them and you will have their back as well as the, the safety of patients. The other thing with that, I would say, is if you have the opportunity, try and get regular one to one sessions with them. Um, and that gives you a private two way dialogue where you can seek their views on key issues and seek support as needed. You can also get their advice and support around your own professional development, because the one thing I've learned over the years is development and leadership and influencing skills are lifelong learning, and there's no magic answer. Um, one size definitely does not fit all. So just to summarise then, I think my, my key learning is to build the relationships, which isn't always easy, um, but do it regardless of whether you need it at that point or not. Make the effort. Use your briefings by email, text and one to one to build confidence, trust and also to educate them about the issues. Um, you know, if I've had to send them an email about um, some problems with serratia, my execs have probably got no idea what serratia is. So I might include a two sentence that just sets out very simply what it is and what the risk is. Utilise those walkabouts and include your non-execs and your other senior leaders in the organisation with you if you can. Use the governance structure and written reports with objective risk assessments uh, and be clear about the decision um, that you're asking for and the accountability. And always, always try to consider that bigger picture and frame your discussions to take account of those wider issues and pressures. Because if your execs recognize that you understand that and you're willing to work with them to get to a solution that deals with your infection risk as well as those wider issues they will own the issue they will engage with you so liz i think that's my my summary of, of my learning over the years anyway i'm sure there are many other things other people have done very successfully but i hope that's useful for listeners 
Uh, abs absolutely, it is. Uh, I, I just feel as though you've summarised my life for the past 10 years as well. Um, I recognise everything that you, you said there, Tracy. It's, um, that is really, really valuable um, ad advice. Thanks, Liz. That's great. I have to say that's all stuff that nobody nobody ever told me and it's all learned the hard way. So um, if it helps people, um, that's fantastic. Absolutely, it, it, it does. I, I learned the hard way, the hard way too. Um, although I was extremely fortunate to have great executive um, support. Uh, so absolutely it's great advice and um, and certainly from my perspective and I'm sure you'd be the same Tracy that that if any senior IP and C team needs to pick up the phone to talk to us then then I'm sure I, I'm certainly happy to uh, to do that and I'm guessing you are too. Oh absolutely Liz, um, phone a friend is an underrated source of support in infection prevention and control um, I, I started my IP career when you were often the only person in the team, so phone a friend was essential. Fortunately, we've moved on from that a long way, but that phone a friend, both for a bit of personal professional support, to be able to screen quietly down the phone and then talk through your issues um, and, and give each other a bit of support and suggestions. Absolutely. Yeah, we've got broad shoulders, both of us. That was really interesting what you said about leadership walkabouts, uh, Tracy. I found them really, really valuable um, in as much that I was often involved in, in uh, preparing a strategy for whatever pathogen we, we, we were dealing with. Uh, and I would issue some kind of didact that said, you must do this and you must do that. And it's only actually going up on walkabouts where you actually talk to people on the front line who say, Liz, that ain't gonna happen. H having, having those conversations with them in their domain uh, really made me sit up and listen to the barriers and challenges that they had in implementing uh, good infection control practice. Um, that said, um, I would often say to them, OK, but you're telling me it's a challenge. You're telling me there are barriers. Uh, I can support you with some of those barriers. But come what may, uh, we do have to implement, uh, be it a cleaning regime or hand hygiene audits or something along those lines. Definitely. And, and I used to I used to talk about the art of the possible. So you'd actually stand there and you say, yeah, I, I, I totally get that. I hear it. I see it. But what's the art of the possible? You know, we may not be able to get from there to there in one jump, but what's the art of the possible today? Because there must be something we can do today to make this a little bit safer. And once you start having that conversation and people start thinking, and there's all sorts of creative stuff they do that just gets you moving towards where you need to be. Yeah, I, I would find that they would come up with their own solutions with with oh, always. I, I, absolutely. I I might have to persuade them that that whatever the intervention was had to be done, but they would find they would find a way of doing it. And uh, and it, it also helped with that relationship building as well. They they didn't feel that I was sitting in my ivory tower uh, and I was beginning to understand the the true pressures that um that that are out there so I, I i think those leadership walkabouts are just so so valuable i think the frustration is that always the thing that go, when you're under pressure and you've got lots of pressure and lots of meetings that people want you in that's always the time that gets snipped away because actually it's the optional bit it is. and it is critical really critical absolutely 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 it is and then the, the, the other aspect which I found really interesting with, with pick, pick your battles, really. Mm. Uh, and I just want to describe uh, one, one battle, uh, which was also a, a bit of a light bulb moment for me. And it, it was going back a number of years ago where we had C. difficile, which was, was not good in our organisation. Mm. Um, indeed, it wasn't good 
amongst many organisations, to be perfectly frank. Uh, so this this really goes back to, to, to 2012, 2013. And uh, I was I was having sleepless nights about about C. diff and Tom Lister from Innovos uh, rang me up um, out of the blue. And he, he just said, how are things? And I just said, Tom, it's just awful. And knowing um, how uh, Innovos are working across the, the country, I, I said to him, well, where, where, where are they doing that? I asked him, where are they doing this right, Tom? He said, oh, there, there's a few places. He said, Adam Brooks, he said, and Royal Wolverhampton. And he very kindly arranged for me to go up and meet the IP and C team there. Uh, and they were they were just wonderful. And coincidentally, on the day I um, I visited, they had their infection prevention and control committee meeting. I, I was just I nearly fell off my chair with the level of ownership that was clearly evident in this organisation. The meeting was chaired by the chief exec and was attended by senior divisional represent representatives, including consultants, matrons, facilities team. And each division or clinical board or whatever you want to call them, fed back their own HCAI data. They outlined their numbers of cases, the results of hand hygiene and cleanliness audits, compliance with antibiotic policies and IP and C training amongst a, a plethora of, of, of other um, uh, interventions. The level of detail was astonishing. I had attended an IPNC meeting in my own health board two days previously, and only two facility colleagues attended. I returned to my own health board and, uh, and escalated the ownership issue. And a subsequent external consultant who visited the organization agreed with my analysis, and that's when things changed dramatically. IPNC became an organizational responsibility. It wasn't the IPNC team's responsibility any anymore, it was an organizational responsibility. We had a, a champion CDIF uh, group which was attended by very senior individuals uh, from, the, from, from, from the divisions. Um, at, unsurprisingly, our uh, healthcare associated infection rates um, went, went down, uh, but that was also supported by, uh, by HPV deep cleans. So I would urge all IPNC teams to assess their level of ownership um, divisional or clinical board attendance alongside the quality of the data being presented is a really good barometer of, of ownership. That said, I, both, uh, I think both you and me, Tracy, can clearly see the level of stress the NHS is currently under. But the IP and C teams must hold their ground with the advice that they give. Uh, outbreaks of any pathogen just adds further stress to the system. And the, the detail that you've given Tracy on how to manage that through escalation and support from executive teams um, uh, is really, really useful, particularly at a time when the NHS is under such uh, difficult um, stress. I hope this podcast has given you food for thought. It's clear that the NHS is under unprecedented stress and keeping patients safe from HCAI is ever more challenging. It is so important that IPNC teams do not shoulder this responsibility alone. IPNC is an organisational responsibility and if any senior nurse needs support with all those important exec papers, then just shout, we can help. And don't forget, of course, that Innovos can also support you with your UV and HPV cleans proactively or in outbreak situations. Just give them a call. 